Hundreds of residents are lobbying against a housing proposal they say would threaten a koala habitat west of Brisbane. Ipswich City Council approved the 2000 home Springview development in March. More than 200 complaints have been made over the development. The council and developer say the native animal populations will be considered as part of the development. Well, joining us now is Professor of Urban Planning at RMIT University and lead councillor of the Biodiversity Council, Sarah Beckersey. Sarah, hi there. Um, the, the developer here saying that uh, it will work with the environment and do all it can, it, is, is that enough? Is that what planning laws require? You know, quite frankly, it's archaic to be considering the clearing of really substantial areas of habitat for threatened species in the middle of a city when we have a biodiversity extinction crisis uh, and there are far better alternatives to building houses where both nature and people can thrive. Remember we've got a government that's committed to no new extinctions and to be nature positive. You know, there are actually old, far better alternatives of uh, seeking out land that's already been cleared. You take an aeroplane into Brisbane and you'll see that there's plenty of it <laughs> and using approaches that actually enable both people and nature to thrive in the environment. So how does this happen? How, how do we get to a situation where uh, Tanya Plebisek will, will say, we are doing all we can, we do not want koala habitats destroyed, and, and yet actually it was more of a rubber stamping thing that the council did? I mean, how does it happen? Yeah, I mean, obviously we need to really focus on having far greater um, and, and more powerful environment laws so that we don't see this kind of habitat destruction happening. Um, but we also need to really just get with it. You know, we, we are continuing to grow our population through urban sprawl. Now, urban sprawl is not good for animals and plants and threatened species, which we continue to lose at a really alarming rate in Australia, mm. but it's a really poor option for people as well. We know that there are places that are hotter. There are places where people have poor access to public transport uh, and really limited uh, capacity to connect with nature. And that's really important, we know, for our own health and well-being. If you're lucky enough to live in a street with more nature, you'll have better physical health, better mental health, your children will have improved cognitive development. It's a total no-brainer that we should be looking to enhance nature in our cities rather than destroy it. So how do, how do we rethink how the construction industry and how planning works? Well, you know, most uh, innovative developers are really looking towards nature positive approaches, seeking brownfield sites, you know, where we've had manufacturing that's not, uh, no longer thriving, or, you know, ex-agricultural land, where we can really bring back nature and also build housing. You know, we think that we actually are quite um, frivolous with the way that we use land in this country, and we should start thinking about not building massive high-rises, but using approaches that have been successful in other countries like sustainable mid-rise, where you can live in a you know, beautiful four-storey uh, block, have shared um, semi-private public space where you can go and have you know, gin and tonics and with your, with your uh, fellow residents and, and watch your children play in, in nature. Uh, and that is a really, it's a very good use of land. Uh, they're really livable environments where people can have good access to services and public transport. Uh, and we don't have to have the impact on our endangered species. Yeah, uh, uh, the council and the developers say that native animal populations will be considered as part of this development, but if the trees are, uh, are chopped down, that eliminates the <laughs> wild animal population, does it? Or are, are well, there ways I'm a, I'm that it can be done? <laughs> I'm afraid to say that you are correct. Um, you know, we've probably kidded ourselves that we can do this thing called offsetting, where we, you know, it's okay to clear habitat over there, but we'll plant some trees over elsewhere and um, just hope that the koalas find their way there and then just wait you know a hundred years for the trees to grow that doesn't work we know that subsequent uh, a series of reviews have demonstrated that offsetting is failing uh, it's not protecting threatened species and what we need to do is being avoid destroying habitat and seeking urban development approaches that are better for people and better for nature. And the argument always is that um, we need more housing. All councils are under immense pressure to provide areas for more housing. Are you saying that can be done without destroying koala habitats, without destroying echidna habitats? 100%. Uh, we know that there is plenty of land uh, that is already cleared uh, within our city. We can do infill developments that are really sustainable 
and, and furthermore can actually be nature positive. They can bring back nature and allow it to thrive within the urban fabric and that's very good for nature but it's also extremely good for people. It can cool a city down really dramatically. Uh, those places with, with a lot of nature, with a lot of canopy cover can be 10 degrees cooler than, the, than, uh, than urban sprawl counterparts. Uh, we know that we can control floods if we have plentiful vegetation and biodiversity in our cities and that really critical benefit to human health and well-being. Sarah Beckersee, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you, it's a pleasure.